Let's go ahead and sing There is Power. Believe in God. Let's sing it. There is power. your presence into this place, O oh God. Lo, 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 la basaya. Yekere basia, lo, 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 la basia. We worship you, we thank you. Hallelujah. You may be seated. God is good. I want to just uh, welcome each and every one. It is good to be in the presence of God. People are prayed up, believing God. So we have a great lineup this morning. Greg, Pastor Greg, Wilder, if I can pronounce that right, Wilder, amen, and Randy Jaramillo, and then we'll have a coffee break, and then we'll have Pastor, uh, Evangelist uh, Glenn Publici. So let's give uh, uh, Pastor Greg a, a warm welcome, amen. Amen. Thank God. Let's uh, open our Bibles to the book of Matthew, chapter 10. It is an honor of all honors to be able to preach in this conference. I'm very grateful for Pastor Stevens for allowing me to do that. Matthew chapter 10. I haven't had a television in over 30 years, but apparently there's a uh, reality TV is a big deal. And there's a reality TV show called Survivors. How many people have heard of that? A few people? I was walking into a store just earlier this month, and one of the uh, store employees yelled across to another employee on the other side, and, and Survivor premiere, uh, premieres tonight. I guess it's like the, the, they started in 2000, and this was the newest version, some, some 40 versions of it they've had. And so Survivor, I want to paint you the picture. This was the first introduction to the very first Survivor uh, reality show. 2000, it says, zoom in on a cluster of beach huts and palm trees. A row of tourists in ill-fitting khakis, t-shirts, and floppy sun hats walk down a rickety dock towards two motorboats. The group then clumsily boards a larger vessel in the middle of the South Pacific. Some locals look on from the shore in bemusement. All the while, a voice narrates the action. From this tiny Malaysian fishing village, these 16 Americans are beginning the adventure of a lifetime. They have volunteered to be marooned for 39 days on mysterious Borneo. This is their story. This is Survivor. Well, apparently this is a very popular reality show where the, they take these contestants, they go to some obscure island, very dangerous place, jungles, different areas, where they're all supposed to be there learning to survive in these various demanding and dangerous circumstances. And at first, they all need each other. They're working together. There's camaraderie. But as the days go on, it becomes cutthroat. And they begin to manipulate. They're lying and deceiving and turning on each other, voting each other off the island and seeking to be the lone survivor because the lone survivor is a $2 million winner. And so this show brings out the reality of human nature 
that when it comes down to money and survival, people can become downright nasty. The scripture that we are going to read, Jesus gives us the key, or one of the great keys to survival in the ministry. Matthew chapter 10, verse 16 and 17. Jesus said, Behold, I send you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. Therefore, be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. But beware of men, for they will deliver you up to the councils and scourge you in their synagogues. I haven't just simply entitled this message, Survivor. And I want to begin by looking at understanding people. Jesus is preparing his workers for their mission. And he says, behold, I send you out. Beware of men. Lord, aren't we supposed to be reaching people? Yes, but beware or be aware. I send you out as sheep among wolves. Sheep are innocent. They're harmless. Wolves are vicious and savage. You, them. He's saying we are to understand people. Now this is a vital part of ministry. In John 2, 24 and 25, but Jesus did not commit himself to them because he knew all men. And he had no need that anyone should testify of man, for he knew what was in man. The contemporary English version says it like this, but Jesus knew what was in their hearts, and he would not let them have power over him. That if you're going to survive in the ministry, you're going to, have to, you're going to need to know what is in the heart of man. Jesus said in Mark 7, 21 through 23, For from within, out of the heart of men, proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lewdness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within and defile a man. That Jesus peels back the layers and shows us the potential of the human heart. And you don't have to serve God very long until you find out that this is true of even the best of people. That people can really be nasty. And they can hurt you really, really bad. Christ is talking about understanding human nature. Knowing what's in people what they can do, or what they are capable of doing. And our whole ministry is geared towards reaching people. We want them to come into our church. We are trying to gather people. We're wanting to work with them and help them, serve them, pour our life into them, make disciples, raise up couples, send workers. But you are going to experience the worst side of people. The ministry shows you how selfish and self-serving people can be. You're going to experience betrayals. That after all that you do and how much you love, pour your life into people that they can turn and walk away. Sometimes they can lie about you. Purposely say things that will damage your credibility harm your ministry. They can turn on you, even people that you've invested your whole life into. And that can be very devastating. It can sideswipe you. It can send you reeling. Because let's be honest, real ministry is different than we thought. We go, we go out with a wild-eyed innocence and you know, it's easy to watch it unfold in the mother church, you know, watch our pastor go through it. But it's quite another thing when it's happening to you. And as I said, ministry will bring you into contact with the worst side of human nature. And this is where a pastor can struggle, can get derailed, 
lose a focus, lose the thrust of discipleship, become intimidated and insecure. You know, God has called us to make disciples. He's called us that we would pour our life into men and couples and work with those that he's given us and, and try to see God's will done in their life. But this is going to cost you in the area of loss and betrayal. Even those that we have the highest hopes for. We've all thought it. This has got to be the one. That this, this guy or this couple... They're, they're the one. They're, they're the ones that are going to really lock in, serve God, raise up, do something powerful for God. And we, we invest hope in them. We invest faith in them and vision. And we pour our life into them at times. And when they leave, or it doesn't pan out, that can throw you for a real loop. Let's talk about the danger zone secondly. Because ministry will require that we cross people's will. As Sir Mitchell said, you never know who someone is until you tell them no. <laughs> when you're, you're going to fulfill the ministry that God has given you, there will be times that you're, well, more often than not, crossing people's will. And Paul told Timothy in 2 Timothy 4, 2 and 5, preach the word, be ready in season and out of season, convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. But you be watchful in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. He told Titus in Titus 2, 15, speak these things, exhort, Rebuke with all authority. Let no one despise you. So fulfilling our ministry is going to bring us into necessary things. Necessary ministry at times will require that we bring judgment. That we're going to have to make judgment calls on people's lives. There will be times where we have to bring correction. And there will be times of discipline. That pastoring is, there are times where it's, it's a discipline issue, whether it's a moral failure or some other area where we need to bring discipline. We'll have to deal with issues. We'll have to preach on things. And then we'll have to deal with certain issues and people. And just the fact that we are to lead by strong leadership brings us into the arena. You know, the Apostle Paul felt that sting in 2 Timothy 4, verse 10, he says, For Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world, and has departed for Thessalonica. In 2 Timothy 1, 15, he says, This you know that all those in Asia have turned away from me, among whom are Phygelus and Hermogenes. John Mark on their first missionary journey with Paul and Barnabas, John Mark leaves, goes back. He says, I can't take this. This is too much. Whether that was just the persecution or the labor or the intensity of it, he left. And we know that on the second missionary journey, Paul said, we're not taking John Mark with us. Because he already jumped ship one time. We can't do that. We need to be focused on this mission. And that caused contention between Paul and Barnabas. Because John Mark is Barnabas' nephew. And so there's a, what, is, what, they, what the Bible describes as strong contention between the Apostle Paul and Barnabas, and they part ways. Barnabas takes John Mark and goes uh, to Thessalonica, and, and si, uh, Paul takes Silas, and they go out to do the work that God wants them to do. You know, Demas, forsaken me, Demas gets all the attention, and we sometimes forget, what about how that how Barnabas' contention with Paul affected Paul. How did that, uh, how did that affect Paul as a, as a man of this dear brother Barnabas? You know, Barnabas was the one who brought Saul into the fellowship. That when, when Paul, before he became Paul, Saul, he's the one that went up and found and brought him into Jerusalem and introduced him to, the, to all the rest of the church and stood up for him and, and was very instrumental in getting Paul into God's will. So the danger 
is in how we react or what do we do. It's problematic when we go into survival mode. You know, survival mode is self-protection. And self-protection is like we can draw back, pull back, withdraw, become intimidated. When you're trying to, you know, do, the, do God's will, working with people, if you're not careful when you're, when you're going through those things and there's, there's betrayal or there's some very difficult things happening and you're, you're reeling from that, it's not easy. And if you're going to survival mode, you start to withdraw from what God wants you to be doing with that, and that fire and that zeal and that passion and there becomes a tendency to self-defense. You know, the, the old fight or flight pulls up. Self-preservation. Or maybe worse, you go on the offensive. Retaliate. Fight back. Sometimes we say, well, never again. Never again. We can take on a very wrong attitude about people become suspicious of others, become skeptical, become cynical. And it's very difficult to fulfill your ministry when you are not looking at people correctly. We adopt this wrong attitude that, well, they're just going to leave too. It's not worth it. If this is what happens and this is how they treat you, and this is how you treat your wife. And this is what they do to your kids. You know, pastors' wives often, they're the focal point of people's ire. And they're afraid to, to take it out on the pastor, so they take it out on the pastor's wife or his children. And that gets to you. That can, that can really affect you. And you become a cynical skeptical person of whoever walks in the doors of that church or the people that are still there. And when you're not looking at people correctly, you stop giving your whole self. You're not really pouring your life into people. Maybe not even seeing the potential. You know, when you, when you go out to Pioneer, you, you really do think everybody you reach is going to stay safe and serve God. That's okay. We all do that. But it doesn't take very long before these kind of things can happen. If you're not careful, it's like the, these, these wonderful people that God's touching, people coming and getting saved. Well, I don't know. Are they really going to make it? Are they just going to go along for a little while and then, then drift away like everybody else or like so-and-so did? And, and you, lose the, you lose the passion to really want to try. And then you start settling for less. You're not contending for revival. You're not contending for breakthrough. Maybe not even believing that God will move or maybe we don't really don't want God to move because then we have to deal with people. Us four no more. <laughs> the dirty dozen. Just us. Becomes very inward. Evangelism kind of just filters, not, not the thrust. It's not the main. It's just, let's just survive. Let's just keep this, this what we have here. Let's just insulate, keep what we have and survive. For, that's not God's calling. Not to be a cliche, but we're not to be a survivalist, right? We're to be a revivalist. And when you are, are not seeing things correctly or seeing people correctly, let's, let's be real. Many only see how it will hurt you one day, you see people wrong. You read people wrong. You get jaded at them. You see their actions incorrectly and come to wrong conclusions about what they say and how they're acting. And you're not even really seeing it correctly. Because it becomes the lens that we view people through. 
the lens that we view ministry through and even God through. So Jesus said, be wise as a serpent, yet harmless as a dove. You know, a serpent, the serpent was what? Cunning. He had wiles, or we know where that's talking in the negative, but just that idea, that, that cunning or that wisdom, it's, it's an insight. Jesus is trying to give us insight that when we're dealing with people, you have to know human nature. And a snake is first and foremost cautious. You know, we all know about rattlesnakes out right here in the desert. You know about rattlesnakes. Well, you know, when that snake rattles that tail, it's not because he's saying, I'm going to bite you. He's saying, please stay away from me. I don't want, and their, their first inclination is to slither away. They're very cautious like that. So Christ is telling us, if you're to be wise as a serpent, you would be wise to have some caution in understanding human nature and then harmless as a dove. Well, a dove is the picture of innocence, purity, gentle. That this is to be our veneer, and I don't mean that in a, in a negative connotation, but that is to be what we present ourselves as, that we're, we are kind and we are loving and we are helping and hopeful, all the while knowing inside our heart, knowing human nature, knowing but not showing. See, what that is is a mode of protection Understanding that people can fail. Understanding what people are capable of doing. And that keeps you in a right perspective. It keeps your eyes seeing people correctly and it keeps your heart right with people no matter what they do. The things they say, the things they do, the things that happen in ministry. And it allows you to have a, per, a perspective that is correct. And so when things happen, betrayals happen or problems take place or people do, do you very wrong, that this is a, you don't get sideswiped by that. It doesn't take you out for months or weeks at a time and you're, you're reeling and in, in defense mode. It doesn't send you for a loop. So the Apostle Paul, he did, he did not let those things affect him to the place of immobilization. He didn't pull back. He didn't say, I'm not going to try with another. Rather, he said, I'm like a drink offering poured out for you. That the more I love, the less I'm loved. But he kept loving. He kept pouring out his life all the way to the very end. And he's still able to trust. He's still able to embrace. After Barnabas walks away, Paul's able to continue on with Silas and start working with another man and preparing this man for God's will. That, in a nutshell, is discipleship. So let's look thirdly at survivors. The ability to survive in ministry comes from understanding what can lie in the heart of people. People really are capable of just about anything. And real survival mode is be wise as a serpent, harmless as a dove. So that means we need wisdom. Wisdom, first of all, is a proper humility. We ourselves are capable of anything. When you understand, you put us in the right situation with the wrong issues, or the, we're capable of just about anything ourselves. Take heed lest you fall. Second thing about wisdom is God calls us to have a servant's heart. Jesus still washed Judas' feet, knew what was in his heart, 
And to the very end, Jesus is serving him, washing his feet. You know, maybe, maybe Judas will change his mind. Maybe he'll turn. Maybe he'll do right. This gives you a hope for people. Gives you a faith for the people that God brings into your ministry. Can I just say that repentance changes everything? That no matter how stubborn, selfish, prideful, immoral, sinful a person can be in a given moment of time, repentance can change everything. It can absolutely change the entire situation. It can cause the the whole situation to turn for God's glory. And this is how you have to live and minister for people. That all the while you are believing God and hoping that they will repent. And you have to see them through the eyes of that potential. This opens our heart to praying for people. You know, prayer is incredibly powerful. James 5, we can quote it. The fervent, effectual prayer of the righteous avails much. But you know, you read that in context, that's actually talking about turning a brother from their sin. Now there's an incredible power given to men and women of God to pray for people to turn and repent and get get right with God. That our, our working with people, one of the most needful aspects is that we are praying for them, even in the midst of very difficult things that we have to do, whether it's judgment or correction, or they are, they are manifesting things or causing problems or attacking, that we are praying effectually and fervently for these people. Because this will open your heart to genuine compassion. As Sir Mitchell said, hurt people hurt people. You know, people that we work with, we forget sometimes. They come from a long line sometimes of rejection. We're reaching sinners. And the things that happen in sinners' lives, or people's lives, before they get saved, before they come into our church, or before we start trying to really work with them and help them, is they have gone through rejection you know, I have, I have in counsel or in working with people, the things that people say they've been through are like, are you serious? That's, that people do those kind of things? Those things happen? I wasn't born in a manger. <laughs> right? When you work with people, and you really get down to trying to help people through their rejection in life. It's amazing what people have been through. They bring that into their salvation. They bring that baggage. They bring those issues. And sometimes those things are there for a long, long time. And it gives you a compassion for the people that you're working with or people that you're trying to help. They don't know how to act sometimes. They don't know how to love. Yes, they're filled with self-interest. Yes, they're filled with self-preservation because that's what rejection does to the human heart. And you can't forget the, the reality of the demonic. You know, the demonic changes people's hearts for the worst. Satan entered into Judas And this element will always be a possibility to those that we love and invest in. The demonic. Many times, though, you find out it's a sin issue. That after all is said and done, the issue is not always the real issue. Down the road, it's revealed they had a sin issue. That when all is settled down, settled, filtered through, 
the reality of that the person, things, they just, they had a sin issue. And they like, people like to deflect that, point the finger, blame. It's you, pastor, it's your wife, it's this church. Uh, let's be real. They just want to sin. And it isn't always apparent in the moment because people hide it very well. I've been amazed. Some of the most vicious attacks that seem so real, like maybe I am doing something. Maybe, they're, maybe they have a point. And, you know, we're not perfect pastors. We know that. But down the road, you, you, you learn they were fornicating. They were having an adulterous relationship that nobody knew about. And yet they're telling you, you're, you're, you're the problem, pastor. It's your wife. It's this church. There's no love here. Or whatever their, whatever their thing is. You know, people can be really nasty. There's a sin issue. Because the issue is not always the issue. And if I can help you anyway, pastor, don't take it personal. I know the attacks are personal. There's younger pastors here. My hope is to help some of you. That are, that are stepping into ministry or have been pastoring for, 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 a, for a little bit, little bit, don't take it personal. Because when you take things personal, you lose, you lose your traction, you lose your focus, and you start thinking everybody is out to get you. Jesus said, be wise as a servant. Be cautious, understand people, and then be harmless as a dove. You know, that word harmless means without harm or not harming. To be harmless as a dove is going to help us love people, serve people, and help people that we know are or may one day hurt us, betray us, leave us. John 13, 2 through 5, and supper being into the the devil having already put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him. Already put into his heart to betray Jesus. Jesus, verse 3, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going to God, rose from supper, laid aside his garments, took a towel, girded himself. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel which he was girding. Knowing that Judas was going to betray him in just a very, very short time, Jesus still washed his feet. Isn't that amazing? Because Jesus knew all things, that the Father had given all things into his hands. He knew who he was. He knew where he was going. This enabled him to serve Judas to the very last moment. This is going to help us serve other people. Serve people's destinies. You know, our our heart as a pastor is that we want to see God's will fulfilled in your life. That's the pastor's heart. Every individual has a destiny and a purpose, and a pastor's desire is to help that person find, know, and do the will of God. This is going to help you serve other people. And Jesus was the master at it. Later in that evening, after he washes the disciples' feet, as they're sitting there and they're having that last supper, verse 27 through 29 of John 13, now after the piece of bread, Satan entered into Judas. Then Jesus said to Judas, what you do, do quickly. But no one at the table knew for what reason he said this to him. For some thought, because Judas had the money box, that Jesus had said to him, buy those things we need for the feast or that he should give something to the poor. Now think of this. Here's ministry. Here's Jesus and his disciples. Here's a man that's betraying him in a matter of minutes. Jesus washes his feet. The other disciples have no idea the drama that's playing out. They have no idea what's going on and the tension and the conflict between Jesus and Judas, to the point that Jesus says to to all of them, the one of you here is going to betray me. And they're all like, is it I? They have no idea. They're breaking bread. They're fellowshipping. He's teaching. He's ministering. And then he tells Judas, go do what you're going to do. In other words, go. Go betray me. 
Go do what you're going to do. And the other disciples are totally oblivious to this drama and the tension between Jesus and Judah. That is effective ministry. That that is effective ministry that you and I are able to minister, make disciples, do the work of the ministry, even if we are dealing with incredibly trying circumstances like Jesus is. Don't let the fact that you are wounded be revealed. The worst thing you can do is get behind the pulpit and start taking shots or defending yourself. Don't let the fact that people are gossiping or say, or even trying to destroy or rip other people off, don't let that fact that you are wounded be revealed because you will do more harm than good and you can really damage your testimony to the others because other people are watching how you and I handle things. And they're going to wonder, will he treat me like that? Will he do that to me? When you go through things, we have to remember the entire congregation. And you cannot get distracted by one or two people or whatever. When we have a whole congregation to serve, give the people the best of you. And so there is a blessing in all of this. You say, is there, is there a blessing in this? Yes, there is. <laughs> this is part of the process of personal growth and development. As a man of God, even, you know, as a, even as a congregant, one of the faithful saints at our church is working with people, following up, witnessing, and evangelism. This is reality. But it's part of the process of how you and I grow personally and develop in ministry. Because we learn through experience. We learn through experiencing people and you learn about people and you understand what people are and who, what they're capable of. And this allows you to understand greater things. And it really is one of the ways to bear fruit. None of us really like the scripture Jesus said, unless a corn of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it abides alone. But if it dies, uh, it brings forth much fruit. We we could quote that scripture, but we don't really like that one. But he's telling us that is what he did. Not only Judas, but we all put Jesus on the cross, right? He died for our sins, and that is the way to great fruitfulness. The pastors that we look up to, Pastor Stevens, obviously, all of our leaders, they've, this is the proving grounds of ministry and the fruitfulness that comes. It's also the means to greater ministry, greater influence. When you and I learn how to do, do right and treat people right and work through problems like this, this will give us greater influence in our ministry. It will bring real enlargement. We all know the saying, what doesn't kill you makes you tougher. Well, in this case, what doesn't kill you makes you wiser. <laughs> when you're enlarged, you're able to pour out more. You're able to pour out your life more to other people. It gives you skills in working with people. We all desperately need people's skills and how to work with different kinds of people. As Paul said, I become all things to all men that by all means I might win some. And in the end, it's a way to find hidden jewels, hidden treasures. Because even though these that Paul listed by name walked away, this opened the door to Silas, Timothy, Titus, even a man named Onesiphorus in 2 Timothy 1, 16 through 18. The Lord grant mercy to the household of Onesiphorus, for he often refreshed me and was not ashamed of my chain. But when he arrived in Rome, he sought me out very zealously and found me. The Lord grant to him that he may find mercy from the, day, from the Lord in that day, and you know very well how many ways he ministered to me at Ephesus. Paul says that about this man, Onesiphorus, the next verse after he said, all of Asia have turned away, except he lists this man that didn't. It's a hidden jewel in the ministry. 
God really does have many people for us. And there's a great joy of true sons, and it makes it all worthwhile. I, I, I want to encourage you that you may be in the middle of something like this. It may be a very, very difficult time of your life, your ministry. God's going to help you. Cast your cares upon the Lord. Draw near to Jesus. He was at all points like you and I. He'll help you. But in all of that, if you keep your heart right, you keep your vision right, you keep your spirit right, you're going to find the people that make up for it. Changes the whole perspective, changes the whole thing. But the truth is, this, it's going to be like this until Jesus comes again. Let's pour our life, ministry-wise, into people that he gives us. Be wise as a serpent, yet harmless as a dove. I want to give a quick word to uh, Pastor Juan Gonzalez. When you were preaching, brother, I, I've never met you, never talked to you. I don't know anything about you. But while you were preaching uh, Tuesday morning, God, God gave me a word that you are a revivalist. God is blessing you in a great dimension. There is a powerful anointing. As a, 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 but Micah 6, 8 says, Oh man, what has the Lord required of you but to love justice, love mercy, and to walk humbly before the Lord your God? God has given you an incredible anointing as a revivalist, as a powerful ministry, and you have an obvious measure of humility on your life today, brother. But as God does things in your life and the trajectory of your ministry goes forward and up, remember to walk humbly before the Lord your God and God will always bless you in a powerful way. Amen. Let's welcome Pastor Harmio. Praise God. John, the 21st chapter. You have your Bibles. Tremendous truth this morning. In fact, all week, all ministry has been a blessing to my life. Uh, and I do consider it uh, a privilege to be here this morning. All right, it's not catching my face. There it is. In 2006, Saddam Hussein was executed for crimes against humanity. And after his death, it was astonishing to see how many people came forward with their tales of cruelty and their stories of this sadistic regime. And many of these stories were unspeakable. I mean, they, they almost make you want to weep for them, but one of the stories that caught my attention comes from the Iraqi national soccer team. And this soccer team, this was run by Uday Hussein, which was Saddam Hussein's son. And he was in charge of all the national sports, and he would come to this team before every single game. And he would tell them, if you lose... I'm going to torture you. If you lose, I'm going to imprison you. And sure enough, after every loss, they'd be taken to the back, they'd be stripped naked, they would be beaten, they would be flogged, they would be made to kick concrete soccer balls until they couldn't walk anymore. Then they were put in prison. And they were released for the next soccer game. They couldn't quit because they know what would happen to their family. So Emmanuel Baba, one of the team members, shared what would go on in the locker room. And he said that before every game, the players would tremble in fear. That they were weeping before every game. And he says, we were no longer playing the sport for the fun of the game. No longer were we playing for the thrill of competition. Nor were we playing for the prize at the end. We were playing out of fear of not providing results. 
the fear of not performing up to par. And as I read this, I couldn't help to think of a Bible conference. I believe there are people here this morning. You have an inner dictator that is tormenting you. It's telling you you're not good enough. Look at the results of your life. Look at your marriage. Look at your ministry. And you've become so result and performance driven that your identity is based on what you have and what you don't have. And it's tormenting you. I want to minister a message today out of John 21 about our identity in a sermon I've entitled, I Am Not. I Am Not, beginning of verse 15 through 17. So when they had eaten breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? And he said to him, Yes, Lord. You know that I love you. And he said to him, Feed my lambs. And he said to him a second time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he said to him, tend my sheep. And he said to him a third time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him a third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. I want to talk first about our identity this morning. Uh, in our identity, this is going to be an issue that you're going to have to deal with uh, and harness in the pursuit uh, to the finish line. You're going to have to get this uh, if we're going to be able to successfully navigate through our Christian walk. You know, in my personal reading, I've been reading about the Renaissance era. And this era changed uh, Western civilization, uh, uh, even until today. And what Renaissance was, Renaissance is a French word for revival. And uh, it was the revival or the rebirth uh, of humanism. And this time, it led to the age of reason, and then it led to the age of enlightenment, to the modernist movement, to the self-esteem movement. Uh, and these humanistic movements, they're ever-present today. But in the time of the Renaissance, it was the rebirth of Greek and Roman philosophy. Uh, it was the way of thinking of Aristotle, Socrates, uh, Plato, Cicero, Sen you know, all of these philosophers. Uh, and it was bringing the way they thought uh, back into society. And the essential idea of humanism is that your worth uh, and your identity is determined uh, on human achievement uh, and human ability. Uh, and in this time, there was profound works. There was profound ability that changed society, architecture, art, and music. However, if you were one that didn't have talent or ability, you were disowned in society. And in fact, you weren't even allowed medicine or medical attention. So self-reliance and self-deification was the outcome and a distancing from the creator and relying on the creator and relying on self. Fast forward, one of the, it led to this humanistic movement that we saw in the late 70s and 80s in our country that's ever present as part uh, of our just society. Uh, it was called the self-esteem movement and some have called this uh, the new reformation. This had a real social shift uh, in our country in the 80s especially, uh, but now it's just part of the fabric of our country. Uh, it was a humanistic movement, uh, an academic scale on how we view ourselves. Uh, it was an inflated sense of self-worth, uh, and it says that everyone is an achiever. This was what they were trying to propagate, uh, that every single person uh, is an achiever. So that they do is in schools, uh, from young age, they would have mirrors. Uh, one of the strategies was they would have mirrors in classroom. And before you can go into the classroom, uh, you'd have to say something good about yourself. Uh, I'm a winner, or I'm a princess, or whatever uh, you wanted to say about yourself. And then you would go, uh, this is where everyone gets a trophy, stems from. 
Nobody fails, everyone passes. And this was supposed to be the answer uh, to crime and to poverty, uh, but they quickly realized that it didn't work. When people realized that they were losers in life, when they weren't the next American idol, there became identity crisis. People were falling into depression. Uh, and what we have is a generation that has been fed a steady diet of praise and validation, and they become dependent on it. This is what social media is, right? It's a catalyst uh, for the, to, to satisfy this need. I need to be liked. I need to be seen. I need to be viewed. In fact, I read that people don't want to go to church because they're going to be called sinners. So many churches have changed their tune to fit this movement. Because we're so enamored with accolades, titles, trophies, and talents. So boil down to people in our culture and society, they get their identity or their self-worth from roles that they play. Mother, father, CEO, farmer or what they've achieved, their degrees, their bank accounts, their cars. But for believers, for you and I, this should not apply. For you and I, we should find our identity in Christ. Our identity should never be achieved, but received. See, God declared mankind's identity in Genesis 1 and 2. Uh, and Genesis 1 and 2 gives us some real clarity. The Bible says that God made man in his image. In Genesis 1, 28, God then blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and multiply. So God created man in his image. Uh, and then the Bible says, then he blessed them. That word blessed means the invoking of God in the man's life. The invoking of God's nature, God's ability, God's power into man. It means divine favor from God. And although sin fractured uh, the spoken identity of man in Genesis 3, uh, the work of Jesus Christ on the cross, uh, the blood of Jesus through repentance, uh, it brings us back to the place uh, where we are made in the image of God. Uh, and when we are in the image of God, uh, you and I, we are a blessed people. That means that God uh, has invoked himself uh, into man uh, with his ability, with his power, and with his nature. This is what Moses was trying to get the people to understand as he is leading them from the children from the from Egypt to the promised land in Deuteronomy 30 19. He says, I call heaven and earth as witnesses today against you, that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life that both you and your descendants may live. What he's saying is that you need to choose life, and that word life means a surrendering to God. God or a moving towards God and when you do that you invoke God into your life into your family when people come to church and they surrender their life to Jesus what they're doing is they're invoking God into their sin-filled disastrous broken life when we give our money Tonight, we're going to have opportunity to give uh, to world evangelism. Uh, when we give our tithes and our offerings, uh, well, we, we're moving our money towards God, and he invokes himself, uh, and he blesses our finances. These men and women that are going to stand up here tonight and surrender their lives to the call of God to go to the mission field. Uh, what they're doing when they stand up here, this isn't just a show. What they're doing is they are invoking God into their ministry. And God blesses those who surrender. Psalms 34, 8. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who trusts him. So since we're blessed, that means now we can be fruitful, right? God blessed them and said, be fruitful, multiply. 
Fruitfulness is a compelling thought. Fruitfulness represents possibilities. It represents that you can do something way beyond yourself uh, when it is done in Christ, uh, that we are now confident uh, that God, now that he's invoked himself uh, into our lives with his nature, his ability, his power, that's far beyond anything that you and I can do on our own, uh, the possibilities uh, now are exciting and thrilling. And this is what conference does represent, doesn't it? Think about Peter. As he's introduced to Jesus the first time, he says, now I'm changing you. Your name is Cephas. You are a stone. And what he's saying to Peter is you're going to be the bedrock of the early church. And then he says, I'm going to make you a fisher of men. Peter is no longer identified as a fisherman or the trade of his father or the career. Now he's identified in Christ. Now the possibilities are far more than what he could have done on that little boat of his. All the possibilities, what God can do, the fruitfulness. When somebody comes to church, you know, this week we've seen people answer the altar call at all of our various churches, week in and week out. We see people come, they give their life to Jesus, they come with all kinds of disasters, suicide, marriages that are broken, uh, lives that are depressed, uh, and they come in. uh, And when they answer the altar call, when they surrender their life to Jesus, He's invoked into their life, then the fruit of the Spirit begins to operate, Uh, the fruitfulness of God uh, will begin to restore marriages <clears throat> begin to restore sanity restore people they begin to discover a purpose and we see the conversion of men and women throughout the world when we give our money God has blessed it invoked himself then we see him open up the windows of heaven and the principle of multiplication takes place that's fruitfulness these people that are going to answer the call tonight the possibilities, they're going to go. They're going to go to foreign lands, places they do not know of. They're going to set up shop and they're going to see miracles take place. We contend for this. This is our identity. This is who we are. It's not that you can be fruitful. You are to be fruitful. You are blessed. And the possibilities that could come from your life is incredible. That we can go with the confidence that God before me, who can be against me? And we should never stop romancing the kingdom. We should never stop thinking of the possibilities because it is endless when God and his nature has been invoked in our lives. This is incredible to think of. What God can do with us. But in the pursuit of fruitfulness, we must be careful as God begins to move on planet earth through our lives, that we don't begin to confuse our identity by what we have or what we don't have. That we don't become performance-based ministries, performance-based Christianity, that we are beginning to have these sub-identities operating in our lives. I read this wonderful article. I'm just going to read a little portion of it. It says, A young man finds value from promotion, praise, and accolades. He receives from his bosses at work. A pastor finds respect, meaning, from the responses of his congregation after he preaches. And over time, these pursuits become the greatest identity of the person. Their heart elevates a sub-identity over their greatest identity. And the power of their greatest identity in Christ is traded for a temporary descriptor of who they are or what they do. And the progressive sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit in our lives is greatly stalled a mist of such identity confusion. See, we can begin to fa- fall into the trap that our identity and our worth is drawn from the results or from the fruit of our life. Or the lack of. So I want to talk secondly about the inner dictator. Because when we fall into this trap. Where we draw our identity from the results. This is a terrible way to navigate through life. Because life and the ministry. 
They have way too many ups and downs. Too many disappointments. Too many setbacks. Too many betrayals. Too many mistakes and failures along the way. And when we're driven with the wrong motivation or life doesn't go as expected, when you're not seeing what you want to see or you are where you think you should be, you begin to fall into an identity crisis. And you begin to run the race, discouraged, robbed of joy, you're miserable. So I want to talk about three areas where we can have sub-identities. The first one is the identity of position and status. In Mark chapter 9, and we know this is uh, Peter's perspective, they say this was the first pastoral conference. This is where they were the great dispute, where they were disputing of who is going to be the greatest. All right, guys, no, I'm going to be better than you. I'm going to achieve a higher position than you. No, I am. They began to dispute, uh, and this was a heated argument uh, of who is going to be greater. There's something that draws us to titles and position, doesn't it? Luke 22, they were in the garden. They were about to arrest Jesus. And moments earlier in the same chapter, Jesus told Peter that you're going to deny me. Peter wasn't going to have any of that. <laughs> he was going to prove his loyalty. He was going to prove that he's going to be the greatest. And so what he does is they begin to approach him. He cuts the ear off uh, the high priest servant Malchus. And Jesus says, no, 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 we're not doing that. Uh, slaps the ear back on and tells Peter to calm down. Peter was fighting when he should have been surrendering. But listen, when we're motivated by status and position, like Peter, we begin to make all the wrong moves, fight the wrong battles, trying to prove yourself. People like this have very few friends because they're always getting in disputes, trying to prove their point and to prove that they're greater. They're smarter. People who are motivated by position and status. They're always trying to control the narrative. Pastors try to control rather than shepherd their church. They're trying to micromanage every situation because their position is on the line. There was a pastor who had hidden microphones all over his church. To catch people talking bad about him. He was constantly listening. When we're motivated by position. Status. Sometimes we won't listen to God. To be a missionary. Or to get launched out. Because that means we have to leave our position. We have to leave our status of preaching out. Your ministry becomes your idol. This is dangerous. Because you see your church as something that propels you into notoriety. And your identity rises and falls based on your position or your status. You know, I was reading a book called Be Yourself, Free Yourself by Alan Wright. Just a very, very good uh, uh, book. And, in, you know, I recommend it. But he was being very transparent about this issue, about his position being his motivation. And he said these words. He says, I didn't want to fall into pornography or sexual sin because I didn't want to lose my ministry. His whole motivation in life was his ministry. Forget about pleasing Jesus. Forget about that this was unholy un and unrighteous. I just don't want to lose my ministry. Charles Spurgeon said the pulpit is never to be a ladder by which ambition is to climb. The second sub-identity we can begin to have is our image and how others perceive us. 
Matthew 16, Jesus predicts his death, and Peter says, nope, you ain't doing that. You are a king. You are a ruler. There's, you're not going to die. You're going to rule. We know Jesus rebukes him. Get behind me, Satan. Jesus was trying to teach a very powerful lesson in John 13 about washing the disciples' feet. And as he begins to wash, <laughs> Peter says, you are, you are not going to wash my feet. Uh, you are, that's too low for you. Uh, that, that is not the image of a leader. <clears throat> Luke 22, Jesus predicts his denial before the rooster crows. You're going to deny me three times. Jesus, Peter, <laughs> no, I am ready to go to prison and to die for you, Jesus. How dare you look at me that way? And oftentimes our identity could be based on our outlook. And all we care about is the noise, the nickels, and the numbers. And we rise and we fall based on what people think of us. Therefore, people are always trying to force a public image. Going around trying to tell people how good you are, how great you are. And we become like Paul, what he said, a man pleaser. Pastors become sheepdogs rather than shepherds running around just trying to please everyone. Well, if you live by people's approval, you will certainly die by their criticism. And if you're more concerned with your appearance and your public image rather than your private life because this Oftentimes is the process when you're so concerned about your image that you neglect your private life. You become nothing more than a Pharisee. Labor and obscurity is not appealing to you. It's why people don't confess. They don't get counseling. Because they rather get rather keep the show going, dig the hole deeper, rather than get some help and repentance. Uh, but they don't want to look bad. Every failure is final, is fatal, when this is operating in your life. The third area where we can have sub-identities is how we compare to other people. In our text, Jesus is setting the course for Peter. He's talking about his ministry of a shepherd. He's speaking of him becoming a martyr. And he's giving him this directive. And what's Peter says? Well, what's John going to do? Well, what about him? How many of those is human nature? How, how will we compare to other people? Other churches? Think about the prodigal, and the older brother. The prodigal son. He is swimming with the swine. He's backslidden. He's sold out. But there comes a time where he comes to his senses. And he comes back home. And the father sees him, runs out, embraces him, throws a party that a backslider's come home. And all of a sudden, the older brother says, uh, you know, you, you didn't make a fatted calf for me. You never done that for me. In Luke 15, 31, the father said, he said to him, son. You're always with me, and all that I have is yours. You're not seeing this right. It taints our perspective when we begin to compare our lives with others. This is a dangerous place to be because we can't handle other people's successes when this is who we are. We're jealous and envious of any revival or any blessing. You're constantly comparing yourself and your ministry. Oh, he had, uh, he had nine. Well, I had 11. <laughs> as long as you're doing better than someone else. And if someone's doing better than you, you're broken. But as the saying goes, success is ever so sweet when accompanied by the failure of a friend. A few years ago, Harvard University did a study and they sent questionnaires to all their students and they said they had two options. Option A, you could make 50,000 a year or option B, you make 100,000 a year. Obvious answer, right? B. But there was a catch. If you chose option A, that means you make 50% more than everyone else. 
Everyone makes 25,000, you make 50,000. <clears> but if you chose option B, you made 100,000, but you made 50% less. Everyone's making 200,000, you're making 100,000. And the overwhelming majority chose A because they would be doing better than other people. Let me tell you, you rob yourself when you're just going to compare to other people. Peter was a man who trafficked in miracles. He trafficked in the supernatural. But his confused identity was a source of conflict with him. You know, John 18, 17 says it so profoundly. As he's about to deny Jesus, Peter says these words, the servant girl who kept the door said to Peter, you are not also one of this man's disciples, are you? And he said, I am not. Peter began to define his life by what he was not. And the Bible says he went away bitterly. I read the funny story of Co Co Coach Cotton Fitzsimmons. He was a coach in the 70s. And he coached the Atlanta Hawks. And the Atlanta Hawks at this time were the worst team in the NBA. So he wanted to motivate his men before, <clears throat> before the game. So he says, gentlemen, tonight, <laughs> instead of being in last place, I want you to pretend we're in first place. And instead of being on a losing streak, I want you to pretend we're on a winning streak. And instead of being a regular season game, let's pretend this is a playoff game. And they were all excited. Yeah, you know, and they went out and they got clobbered by the Boston Celtics. <laughs> Coach Fitzsimmons was upset. He was throwing his clipboard at the end of the game. And one of the players came to him, slapped him on the back, said, Coach, cheer up. Just pretend we won. You know, so many people pretend that everything's okay. But you're conflicted, man. You're tormented. You have an inner dictator saying, I am not. And you're no longer running the race for the joy of salvation. You're not running the race for the prize. But you have defined your life by what I am not. I am not fruitful. I am not called. I am not able I am not a leader. I'm not good enough. This is real, man. You know, when I was in Vancouver, Canada, I was there, my family and I, we were doing everything we knew to do. We would outreach in the snow, in the rain. We were trying to build everything we knew to do that we did everywhere else. But it was a struggle. And it was an expensive church. And I remember times I would call Pastor Stevens and I'd be feeling guilty. Pastor, man, you know, spending so much money and I'm having this whole breakdown. And he says, Randy, don't worry about it. You do, you do what you, you, you know, you, you're there to do and we'll do what we're going to do. You will give and you just keep laboring. Like no big deal to him. He hangs up and I'm like, I'm feeling guilty. I'm feeling tormented. And the problem was I was thinking that the results were up to me. You know, we can get into our own head. We have a carnal nature, man. And if we're not careful, we can begin to re-identify our lives. You know what Peter did after he went, after he denied Jesus? He went fishing. He re-identified himself back to a fisherman. And if we're not careful, we'll begin to look for things that will provide us a sense of self-worth. And some are quiet quitting. It's a term that means that you look good on the outside, but you've quit in your heart, man. Ministries become secondary. Like Pastor Mitchell used to say, a hobby pastor. For some, church has become optional. Sin has become appealing. So let's close by talking about, do you love me? In our text, Jesus is restoring Peter. And he's repositioning Peter for true fruitfulness. He's repositioning Peter for kingdom success. And he tells him three times, 
do you love me? And you all know the principle of repetition. When something was said in executive order, it means it is important. This is extremely important, Peter. I need to know if this is operating in your life uh, because this has to be the motivating factor for you. That you love me if you're going to feed my sheep, if you're going to operate in my calling, if you are going to be a martyr and position the church for generations to come, you are going to have to have this as the motivating factor. Do you love me? <clears throat> that everything you do, Peter, is to please me. That you do what you do to hear the words, well done. Because love, if you love me, you will go anywhere. You will go any place, any time. You will love what he loves. You will love souls. You will love holiness. You will love the mission field. You will love world evangelism. Consider the Apostle Paul. 2 Corinthians is a defense to his ministry. The church, as Pastor Wilder said, people could be pretty nasty. Well, they were nasty back then too. They came against his position, his apostleship. They came against his stature. They came against his preaching. Everything you would think that would provide you a sense of worth, they came against. Paul could have easily said, you know what, forget these people. I'm done, I'm finished, I'm out of here. But he didn't. He powered on, he continued. 2 Corinthians 5.14 says, For the love of Christ compels us. Because we judged us if one died for all, then all died. And he died for all that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. Paul says, you know what? I'm not going to abandon ship. I'm not seeing everything I want to see now, but you know what? I don't do what I do for position. I don't do what I do to be on Christian Today magazine. I don't do what I do today for a title. I do what I do because I love Christ. And this compels me to power on. If you read Paul's writings, he'll say, Paul, a bondservant of Christ, call to be an apostle. His identity wasn't in his position. It was in his relationship. Love doesn't seek its own. Love believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things, and nothing can separate us from the love of God. When love is the driving force, it changes everything. Fruitfulness is a mystery. It's a mystery. Sometimes it happens. I've seen revival where the church is filled up in day one. But I've seen the struggle. How it happened, I don't know. And maybe you're, seeing, you're here today, you're not seeing what you want to see, and you're frustrated. You have to remember that fruitfulness is a mystery. But you must recognize and know your identity. You are blessed. God has invoked himself into your life. That means that you will be fruitful. How it comes, I don't know. I don't know how the story is going to be written, but I know one thing is that I know my identity and fruitfulness is part of that. And it's going to happen. And it will happen if we stay the course. Jesus said to Peter in this same text, a little bit, a few uh, verses later, he says, Peter, follow me. Just follow me. And the second time he's given Peter this command. The word follow really is, is what John, Jesus said in John 15. He says, I am the vine. You are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. Establish yourself in me, Peter. Let me be the source of all your spiritual nutrition. Let me be the source of your dignity. Let me be the source of your identity. But in order to do that, you have to love me more than you love yourself. You have to die to yourself. 
hate your life to gain it. Lest a grain of wheat fall to the ground and dies, bears much fruit. And Peter, when he finally got this, once his identity was on the unchangeable rather than the changeable, on the blesser rather than the blessing, his life made incredible impact. 3,000 get saved. A couple chapters later, another 20,000 get saved. We know that he became a martyr that allowed the church to further for generations. First and second Peter speak of his change. You ought to read this on your own. First Peter chapter 1 and 2 speaks of the identity of Christ. It's a masterpiece. He says things, a chosen generation, a special people. We are the people of God. His identity has now been shifted because he loves God. That was the priority of his life. But in order to truly love God, we have to come back to the understanding of 1 John 4, 19, that we love him because he first loved us. That you and I, we are blessed to be a part of what God is doing here on planet Earth. Not because of you, but because he initiated this. That while we were yet sinners, Christ demonstrated his love by the death of the cross. We don't deserve the love of God. We don't deserve the destinies that we function in. We don't deserve to be here this morning. We don't deserve to handle sacred things. We don't deserve to be behind this pulpit. 2 Timothy 1.9 says, Who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his purpose and grace, which was given to us in Christ Jesus before time. What we need to do is choose life. Move towards God. Trust in his power. Because unless he builds the church, we labor in vain. Amen. Not by might, not by power, but by his spirit, saith God. Outcomes, results are not up to us. We do the natural, he does the supernatural. Amen. Whether he saves by few or by many. Will you let him interrupt your life? Will you allow him to use you this today? Will you give him back control and have no confidence in the flesh? Will you just say, Pastor, maybe you need to go talk to him. Maybe the altar today, God, I just want to do my part. Whatever that is, I want to be a partaker. And if we can get back to this, back to the place where we say, God, thank you. I don't deserve this. Fruitfulness will come. And a confidence can be restored and that your joy may be full in running the race. You know, I was coming to a close. I was in a conversation at Presque. It was my first Presque conference uh, with the new building. It was just phenomenal. And we're with a couple guys there. One of the guys says, man, we're small guys in this fellowship. And somebody turned up and says, no, we're just a part of something really big. You know, we're called just to do our part. God is moving in ways that are beyond our imagination, beyond our, our conception. All we're called to do is our part. And you would be shocked at the outcomes that God will do when he's involved. You know, I'm going to close this story. I was talking with Pastor uh, Bob McCullough and Pastor Craig Wilder. They were telling me about Pastor Craig Wilder's mom, Candace, who's here today. She got saved in 1987 in Northern California. You know, she moved to, a, I believe, a little apartment and a fellowship church just opened up. She got saved. Uh, and the church, like many pioneer churches, was up and down. And after a few years, it was just her. <laughs> Thank God for people like that in our churches, right? Amen. She stuck it out. But they decided to close the church down. 
And she moved back to Oregon and she started attending the church that Pastor Frank Luna pioneered. And while she was in California, Pastor Craig, he, was, he wasn't Pastor Craig then, he was a rebel teenager with him and Bub McCullough getting their fishing degrees. But when she moved back to Oregon, Craig got saved. Craig brought Bob McCullough. He got saved. Bob McCullough witnessed to Troy. He got saved. They all got married, and now they're wonderful pastors in our fellowship. So Pastor McCullough was in Prescott just a few years ago, and he heard a voice, and it was of the pastor that he visited in 1987 or 88. And he says, are you pastor so-and-so? And he says, well, yeah, I'm him, but I'm not a pastor anymore. That was many years ago. But Bob says, I want to just thank you. I'm saved because of your life. And he says, you know, Candace moved to Oregon, and he began to tell the story of how all these men got saved. And I believe, like, through Candace, you know, six pastors were eventually out of Oregon. And as Bob's telling him this, this man begins to weep weep and he says I thought that was a complete failure but what he didn't realize is that he was just doing his part we never know what God's doing God isn't looking for ability but availability he wants to invoke himself into your life let us let the love of God compel us this morning that's all that I have Amen. What a powerful preaching. Amen. How many enjoyed that? Praise God. Let's go ahead and stand. Believing God for good things. I just want to remind you, amen, that we have a wonderful coffee break. Amen. But no food here in the main sanctuary, food or drinks. And then be back here five minutes till 11. Amen. How many will do do that? Hallelujah. Praise God. Let's bow our heads. Pastor Willis Gordon, if you would just pray for the... Fellowship. Amen. Amen. Praise God, you enjoy it.